All right, 717 questions for this week from May the 12th. There's some questions about Abraham and the offering up of Isaac. First question was, did Abraham offer up Isaac as a burnt offering out of his fear of God or his love of God? And the answer is uh, probably both. And there's a few other things. The Bible says that Abraham offered up Isaac out of obedience to him. So Abraham proved his faith by his obedience. That's what the book of James says. But in addition to that, the book of Hebrews says he offered up Isaac out of faith in God, knowing that God was able to bring Isaac back from the dead. So apparently Abraham, according to the writer of the book of Hebrews, when he took Isaac up on the mountain, Mount Moriah, to offer him up, had the sense that God would do something to reverse anything that happened in that moment, that God would bring him back from the dead or something like that. So it appears that Abraham's obedience to God, Abraham's faith in God, Abraham's love for God, and Abraham's uh, commitment to the promises of God, even if the command seemed to be causing him trouble with the fulfillment of those promises, those things motivate Abraham, I think. It's hard to know exactly what motivates a person when they do something. And we're not told explicitly in the text, but that would be my guess. His obedience to God, his love for God, and his faith in God that God would reverse anything that he did to get him back to the place of promise. The second thing is, uh, why does uh, God continue to call Isaac your only son, the one you love, and doesn't say this about Ishmael. Well, because Ishmael was never supposed to happen in the divine plan of God. This is uh, a side journey, an adulterous relationship with the employee. And so he's not, Ishmael is a, an offspring of Abraham, but not a son. And in fact, the Bible refers to him this way. Paul refers to him this way. Ishmael's not a true son but really a slave in the household because he was born to the mom who's a slave. And I know that's harsh from 21st century thinking, but the reality is that Abraham's encounter with Ishmael, I mean with Hagar that made Ishmael, made Ishmael not a son per se, but a slave. However, God reverses this in Ishmael's life in that he blesses Ishmael and makes him a great nation. So God takes the normal outcome of events, such as the sleeping with a slave, like Abraham did, which would give him an offspring of slavery, instead makes Ishmael a promise too that's similar to Abraham. So he takes Abraham and Sarah's sin and their, their lack of patience with God over that promise. And he takes it and makes a promise out of it to Ishmael. But in terms of the culture, it is true that all Abraham had done is move the place from uh, Eliezer, the son of one of the slaves in his home, to Ishmael, who was a half-son, half-slave in his home, uh, that, that Ishmael was still never really a true son because he was not a son of his actual wife, or a son of promise. So that's why God says, take now your son, your only son, the one you love, the real son of promise, not the slave that you had through Hagar. How does uh, he keep Isaac from running off? The answer is Isaac is apparently obedient in this act as well. Apparently Isaac submits to this statement by the father. You're the lamb. You're the offering to God. And apparently Isaac says, okay, if, I, if that's it. So a lot of speculation has been here that Isaac is as obedient as Abraham in this moment in that he submits to his father's will the same way Abraham was submitting to his heavenly father's will. That's why in Jewish commentaries, I mentioned this on Sunday night briefly, that in the Mishnah and the Talmud, it's entitled, this chapter is entitled, The Binding of Isaac, not the Offering of Isaac. And it's entitled uh, not the the as much the faithfulness of Abraham alone, but also the faithfulness of Isaac to submit to the Lord's will. So yes, the reason Isaac doesn't run off is apparently Isaac is embracing this divine plan as well. Does Isaac feel that God would bring him back from the dead? Maybe. So we're not told exactly why Isaac is so obedient here in this moment, but apparently he is. Also, uh, someone asked a question a little bit outside of the Genesis text, but also an Old Testament reference to 
1 Samuel 15, 35, the Lord regretted making Saul king. The Lord regretted. We see this, that the Lord regretted or relented in a few places in the Bible. You see it in Genesis with no, the Noadic flood. We saw that a few weeks ago, that God regretted even making man. What we have in this is a statement of the heartbreak of God in terms that humans can understand. Clearly, th that to say, I regretted doing this, was to imply that God didn't know what was going to happen. And so part of the problem with that kind of language is that we go, okay, well, wait, if he knew what was going to happen, he did it anyway, and then regretted it. Why does God have a regret if he knew that was what was going to turn out? Um, so he regrets making people, Genesis chapter uh, 5 and 6, 7 and 8, the Noadic flood account. Or in this case, he regrets appointing Saul as king. The answer to that is that we get a human emotion out of God that basically says, I'm heartbroken over what's happened here. Uh, so there's some, and I used this term before, anthropomorphizing, this attributing to God human emotions so that we can comprehend what's going on in the heart of God over something. So the regret is not like our regret because it's a regret with knowledge. Most of our regrets are without knowledge. I regret doing this because if I had known that this would happen, then these things would occur. Clearly with God, something else is going on there. But I think the language is uh, human language that helps us understand the heartbreak of God over the way things turn out. So I think that's what's going on there. Now the next question is a really challenging question. It has to do with the if uh, all sin results ultimately, or the consequence of all sin is death, then what do we do with the death of innocence? Maybe someone born uh, with a mental capacity that is so low that we couldn't even uh, uh, attribute moral standards to them, and yet they die, and they didn't sin the way Adam sinned, or they didn't sin the way you or I sin, or you have a young child or even an infant, and yet they die. And the question is from this, doesn't it seem like this is, a, a, what does it say about God to hold them to these kinds of consequences? And I want to distinguish because within the question, there was a, a, an association that the temporary earthly consequence of sin, which is physical death, implied eternal judgment of the same. And I do want to suggest that's not always the case. People die that are uh, not, don't have the mental capacity to be held responsible for judgment or sin, and they die because they are not freed from the earthly consequences that all people have been brought into by Adam. But all people brought under the earthly consequences of Adam's sin does not mean all people face the eternal consequences of human sin. So just because an infant has died does not mean that this means they also face the eternal judgment. So I would distinguish between temporary earthly condemnation of human sin and rebellion and the fallen world and eternal judgment for sin for being outside of the grace of God. For instance, if an infant dies, I think they fall under the edict by Jesus that the kingdom of heaven was made for such as these. And in fact, he tells the disciples, you gotta become like one of these or you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. So children, have a special dispensation in God's economy, God's plan, God's salvation, but that doesn't prevent the consequences of our human rebellion. And it, it is not just harmful to the child if you lose a child, it's painful to adults. It's a constant reminder, a painful, bitter reminder of the consequence of human sin in the fallen world. But that reminder doesn't mean that that person faces eternal judgment of the same. I believe that when infants die, they're taken immediately into the presence of God. They've done nothing to warrant eternal judgment from him. And so because of that, I would suggest that from the question, I gathered a really good question, but I, I gathered there was a connection between uh, temporary consequences for sin implying eternal consequences of sin, and that's just not always the case. You, you have it in several examples in the Old Testament and New, where King Josiah dies at a young age of 29, but he's considered a king of God's own heart like David, and yet you have other kings living long, long time like Manasseh, who was an evil king. So just because someone dies young does not mean God's judgment, and just because someone dies old and uh, into their 80s or 90s or 100s means God's blessing on them eternally. Uh, it just means they had some different earthly outcomes.
And so I think I would distinguish between temporary earthly outcomes and eternal judgment. Those don't always uh, match up. In fact, often do not match up. I hope that answers the person's question. That's a very good question. We'll see you guys Sunday night, 717.